All right, let's uh, uh, get started this morning. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our lesson. Our great Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us. Father, for the beautiful sunshine and the weather. Father, for just all of the blessings that uh, uh, make this day uh, so special to us, especially uh, being the first day of the week and the day um, that the church is uh, to gather and to blend our hearts and our minds, our voices, and in worship and praise, honor uh, to Thee, the only living and true God. Father, we are uh, mindful of those that we know of that are sick, those who have uh, family members that are struggling with various uh, uh, matters of, of health. We're thankful for our prayers that have been answered in, in regard to others that have returned home. And we just pray your continued blessings on, on all those that, that we know and love that, uh, that continue to struggle with uh, the daily issues of life. We're grateful for this congregation. We pray that you'll continue to bless us. We're thankful for uh, this opportunity and, and this time wherein we uh, go back and, and do the things that, as we've had done for, for so many years, and we pray that such will continue, that we'll be uh, admonished and encouraged, edified uh, by our time together, our studies together, our fellowship together, and our worship together. We pray as we enter into this day, uh, as a, a body of thy people, that you will forgive us of any sins that are in our lives, and Father, that uh, our, our service and our worship to Thee this day uh, will be acceptable in Thy sight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, looking at this, the lesson on losing biblical awe. And uh, the, the, matter, uh, the matter is, of course, you see the, uh, the, the title of the book is Making God in Our Image. And that uh, has been a problem for a long, long time uh, that men have always sought to make God. Uh, in their own image. In other words, they, they change God, the idea of God, they fashion, you know, and by the way, and I don't even mean, I'm not even talking about idolatry in the sense of making images, etc. I'm talking about just the way we think about God uh, is always, is always uh, a concern. And we have to have a proper uh, thought process, a proper view of God. And so looking at just in the opening uh, the two passages that are underneath, the two passages that are underneath the title, there are Exodus 20 and Exodus 32. And so we're going to read those uh, two to, to kind of set the stage. Uh, it says 20, 18, and 19. We'll read through verse 20. The next one says chapter 32, 1 to 4. We'll read through verse 5. All right, but in Exodus 20, beginning in verse 18, now this is the first. This is the first verse after the conclusion of the Ten Commandments. This is the first verse uh, after the conclusion of the Ten Commandments. And it says, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us and we will hear but do not let God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. And so Moses, Moses is trying to reassure the people, but at the same time he's giving them warning that their attitude toward God will determine the way they live their lives. He says, 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 the fear of God should be in you so that you do not sin. And so, and so there's, the, there's setting the stage, uh, really for the entirety of the rest of this book, is that our view of God is going to determine uh, the, the, I would say, the easiest way to say, the, our view of God will determine the level of holiness to which we will attain in this life. If I don't have a very high view of God, I will not live a very holy life. Uh, if I hold God in, in, in extremely high regard, uh, then I will continually pursue the matter of personal holiness because I'll recognize who God is, I'll recognize what I am, and how far the difference is between the two, and then thus that will compel me to live a life of, of utter holiness. In other words, to the best of my ability to live as holy a life as I possibly can. And so now here's the stage. Here are the people. 
the, the, the Ten Commandments have been delivered. The people see, they see the lightning, they hear the thunder, they see the mountain smoking. I mean, it's just, it's just an incredible physical sight. And the people are so impressed by God and, and this manifestation of God, which, by the way, is only a, just a, a drop in the bucket or a drop in the ocean to you know, God's majesty. And it's such that they don't even want God to talk to them. Because if, if God talks to us, we'll die. So that's the position that they're in. Now, let's just go a, a little while, I mean, just a short time later, over to Exodus 32. Moses goes up into the mountain to receive the law, and he's, you know, he's gone, you know, about 40 days. About 40 days or so, he's up in the mountain receiving, you know, receiving the law. And... Uh, in verse 1 of chapter 32, it says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Moses saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now, in the space of less than two months, the people have gone from don't want to hear the voice of God lest we die to make us an image that we can worship, that we can see in direct violation of uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. You know, from the Ten Commandments. And so we see that it, in many cases, it does not take very long for us to lose our awe of God. I mean, the, in essence, the people lost it in mass in just a very short period of time. And so that's why we always have to be on guard in, in, in respect to our, our view of, of God, and then it's not it's not in your it's not in the book. But I made a note. You know, I think about Malachi in Malachi chapter one, in Malachi chapter one, beginning in verse six. These are the people who have been returned from exile. The city of Jerusalem has has been rebuilt. The temple's been uh, rebuilt, and here are the people. Here are the people of God. And here's what God says to them. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name. In other words, the, the people who were, who were God's own chosen religious leaders, the priests. You priests who deny or despise my name. You offer defiled blood on my altar. But you say, in what way have we defiled you? When you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to the governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. In other words, even the priesthood had abandoned their awe of God. Because anybody who stands in awe of God is not going to bring a blind lamb to the altar. First of all, anyone who has, stands in awe of God is not going to bring a, bring a blind lamb to the priest. Much less the priest offer it as a sacrifice. You know, the priest should have said, what is this garbage? What do you mean bringing... What do you mean bringing a blind lamb to offer to the Lord? What do you mean bringing a, a, a crippled lamb? What do you mean bringing a sickly, puny lamb to offer to the Lord God of heaven? That's what the priest should have said. But instead, they offered it as, as if everything was okay. 
And so God first condemns the priests on that count for offering these things. And so he starts with the religious leaders who have lost their awe of God. And then, of course, it, it's manifest then uh, in, uh, in the lives of the people. In chapter 3 of this book, chapter, Malachi 3 and verse 9, it says, Will a man rob God that you've robbed me? But you say, In what way have we robbed you? It says, In your tithes and offerings. Notice, when you, when you don't give me what is mine, you rob me. You know, it's like you know, a, really, a really limited and poor example, but I think one that at least, that at least p puts the idea in our mind, is you know, if, I worked, if I worked at a store and I intentionally kept shortchanging short people, you know, back when everybody used to use real money, you know, when they came and they used real money and you got change back, you know, you know well, what would you say about a man who, who, who had a store and intentionally shorted people change every single time out? Doesn't matter how much it is. What's he doing? He's practicing robbery. He's not taking what is not his. He's keeping what is not his. And so the, the, and the effect is the same. He's robbing his customers. Well, the same thing, God says, you're robbing me because you don't give me what, you don't give me my due. In your tithes and your offerings, you're robbing me. And, I'm, you know, and of course, you know, the example is, you know, how, many, you know, how many people who profess to be children of God rob God every single Lord's Day in, in their giving? They rob Him every single Lord's Day. They don't give as they've been prospered. They don't give with a generous heart. They don't give in, in a way that in any way reflects any type of personal sacrifice. You know, I say it a lot. You know, if you're giving to the Lord doesn't change the way that you live, you're not giving to the Lord. You're just giving to yourself. You're just giving to pacify your, your own desires. Because what you're saying is, the Lord's not important enough for me to give up some things. It's not important enough for me to give up some things. And thus, you know, people who claim to be children of God rob God every single Lord's Day when they don't give as they've been prospered. They don't give sacrificially. They don't give uh, the first fruits. And by the way, what's the cause of that? I don't stand in awe of God. I don't stand in awe of God. Because if I did, I wouldn't offer that some piddling little old amount. Uh, you know, that really doesn't make a whole lot of difference so far as my life or whatnot is concerned. And so, uh, so this is, a, and the point is, this has always been a problem for the people of God. It's always been a problem for the people of God. Um, and so uh, losing, and I'm not talking about the giving part, I'm talking about the losing the awe of God, which is manifest in many ways, that just simply uh, being one of them. All right, in... Uh, in the opening line, it says, uh, uh, actually, the very end of the first line, it says, Our personal concept of God is the most important thing in our belief system. What I, my, personal, my personal view uh, or concept of God is the most important thing in my belief system. Why? Number one, my personal view of God affects my concept of the Bible. You know, how I view God's going to affect how I view the Bible. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, and I'm not talking about how much I read the Bible, how much I study the Bible. It's going to affect my view of the Bible. How am I going to receive the teaching that is in the Bible is determined by my awe or lack thereof of God. It affects my view of Jesus. It affects my view of Jesus. It affects my view of the church. My awe of God or my personal concept of God affects my view of the church. And it specifically, it affects my worship. I already mentioned it affects my giving. It affects my singing. It affects my attitude toward the Lord's Supper. It can hinder my prayers. It, affect, it affects how, you know, you know, how closely I'm in tune to whatever, whatever sermon or lessons are being taught. I'm not talking about, and I'm not talking about just like losing your focus for a moment. I'm talking about doing our best to be in tune to the things that are being said. And so, uh, well, and it, and this, my view of God, uh, my view of God affects my attendance. 
It affects my attendance. You know, whether or not I'm going to be in Sunday school, whether or not I'm going to be back tonight, whether or not I'm going to be here on, on Wednesday night. And then beyond that, it's going to affect, it's going to affect my participation in the life of the church. You know, am I able to teach class? Do I teach class? Am I willing to try to learn to teach class? Can I do Wednesday night devotional? Have I ever done one? Am I willing to try you know, to do one? In other words, uh, or, or just any any aspect of the you know I'm thinking more of the, of the teaching and the public aspect uh, of the, of the life of the church, but my view of God's going to affect how how engaged I am uh, in the matter of the church within the local body, and so uh, these things are all extremely extremely important. Oh, and lastly, this uh, are two things: my view of God's going to affect my view of the lost. You know, do I look at lost people the same way that God does? Do I look at myself the way that God does? Do I, do I see myself as God sees me? You know, am I lost? Am I lost? Does God see me as a lost person? If God sees me as a lost person, then I need to see me as a lost, as a lost person. So that, so that I can find God's remedy. And then my view of God's going to affect my view of the world. You know, the Bible says, do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. 1 John 2 and verse 15. Uh, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, Paul said, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Or here's Demas, a fellow laborer at one time. I believe it's in the passage in Colossians 4. Uh, Demas is listed as a co-worker, a fellow laborer. Uh, he's mentioned again by name in the book of Philemon. But the last mention we have of Demas is he's a forsaker. He's abandoned Paul, having loved this present world. And so uh, my view of God is going to determine uh, my view of the world. All right, now, over on to page 2, the, there's an introductory to, on page 1 that carries over into page 2 with regard to the matter of of uh, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, and particularly from Matthew 15, Matthew 15 and beginning in about verse 7. After the, after the, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders had uh, engaged in a debate with Jesus about, uh, about matters that really pertain to the Jewish law, I mean to the Jewish tradition and not to the Jewish law, he says, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. And so, and by the way, uh, let me just make a mention here, and I don't, I don't know that I've even ever noted this distinction. This is not one thing, this is not one thing that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about more than one thing. First of all, he's talking about there's a heart problem. People draw nigh to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and they do worship me in vain. See, there's two things here. You know, first of all, your heart, he says, their heart's not right. Second, they teach what they want in matters of worship, and thus, in so doing, it makes their worship vain. And so one obviously leads, one obviously leads to uh, the other. Or, and, or we might say the second is, is a, a, a symptom of the first. And so uh, we need to be, you know, be mindful of this. Now on page, on page two, page two, you know, note the very, at the very top of the page. You know, the first thing that Jesus says about this matter is makes people hypocrites. It makes them hypocrites. By the way, uh, I heard a sermon one time, and I can't remember who preached it, and I can't, it's been over 20 years ago, but it was called, it was called The Sin Never Confessed. The Sin Never Confessed. And the sin was hypocrisy. You know, people will confess all kinds of sins. They'll, they'll confess having a bad temper. They'll confess... Sexual sins, they'll confess, confess 
personal, you know, personal individual failures. Says, but nobody, you know, and the point of the preacher was, I've never in all the years that he preached, he said, I've never had anybody come up and sit on the front pew and say, I've been a hypocrite. I've been a hypocrite. And so hypocrisy, Jesus says, those who honor me with their mouth, draw nigh to me with their lips, their heart is far from me. The first, the first condemnation is they are hypocrites. Their devotion or their religious devotion was lip service. Their true devotion was to an object far from God. But their heart is far from me. And their structure for their religious devotion was the precepts of men. Um, now I want to note one thing in uh, about the fifth line down. It says, their religion was directed to something other than all, the Almighty God, hence it was vain. The religion was directed to something other than the Almighty God, hence it was vain. And then I made this note. Their devotion was to their religion. Their religious devotion was directed to their religion. They worshipped their religion. They didn't worship God. God, God, was not, you know, God was not the authority in the, their, in the matters of their lives or in the matters of, of their religious practice. Their religion was their authority. And particularly their religious tradition was their authority. Therefore, they worshipped their own religion. And by the way, that, you can think about this, and I think about this, a lot of things came to my mind. It, you know, I think about you know, Catholicism. Catholicism is a devotion to a religion. You know, it's works-based, it's works-oriented, it, it's, you know, it's almost null and void of grace. And, and, and people worship, Catholics worship their religion. They don't worship God. They have objects of devotion. They're idolatrous. They practice idolatry. I mean, in the purest sense of the word, they practice idolatry. And not just idolatry to their religion. But look, anytime, anytime a person hears the truth and refuses to change because, because of what they were raised to be, or what, or what they are, or what they were raised to be, they're worshiping their religion. Their religion is, is what's the most important thing to them. Or if they, refuse, if they refuse to obey the Lord because their parents or their grandparents didn't obey the Lord, then almost their parents or their grandparents become the object of their devotion. Because whatever they did is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do what, I know, I know you showed me this in the Bible and I know this is right, but I'm not going to do this because my parents didn't do that. Well then who are you worshiping? Who are you serving? If you don't obey the gospel because your parents didn't obey the gospel, because your grandparents didn't obey the gospel, or because your parents or your grandparents were members of some religious, religious body that can't be found in the pages of the New Testament. Who are, who are these people really worshiping? They're worshiping men or the memory of men. And so, you know, and it, it, and it, look, it co still comes back to they don't stand in awe of God. They don't stand in awe of God. And then letter A on page 2. It says, no person ever rises above his idea of God. No person ever rises above his idea of God. Now, why, now why is it that true Christians, true believers, can always find room for improvement? Why is that? Because we recognize where God is, right? No, we always recognize that God is so far above us and we're still, you know, we're still climbing, 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 climbing. There's always room, there's always room for improvement. All right? But if my idea of God is somewhere far lower, I can never get above that. Because whatever my view of God is, I can, never, I, can never go, I can never go higher than that. Think about this. Think about the religions of the Romans and the Greeks. Okay? Think about their religious practices. I mean, sexual immorality of 
every sort, whether it be prostitution, homosexuality, uh, pedophilia, I mean, just everything under the sun. Well, why, why did they practice those things? Because their gods practiced those things. You know, if you spend a little time reading Greek mythology or Roman, or Roman mythology, and you read about the gods of the Greeks and the Romans, there's always, there's always some base, earthly thing going on. Right? I mean, like Narcissus. You know, so, you know, he's, he, you, know, he's ena- you know, he's enamored with himself. You know, he is enamored with his own reflection. Well, I mean, narcissism was a, was a big part of, of Greek and Roman mythology and, and, or the practice that, that people have, you know, the worship of the body. You know, in other words, those things, are, are, those things are, are, are rooted in their view of their gods. Okay? The pursuit of pleasure is rooted in Greek mythology. I'm, you probably don't remember this, but it, I have a, a, a PowerPoint uh, called You Can Trust the Seed. It's really a, it's a PowerPoint about and sermon about trusting the Bible. Okay, That's what it's about. But in that PowerPoint, I took some pictures in the London or the British Museum of what is called the Freeze, the F-R-I-E-Z-E, the Freeze, which was, which was kind of a, a top, uh, we call what. Well, I don't know what you call it. It's almost like a, a molding around the top of the Greek Parthenon. And it was sculptures of their gods, of the Greek gods. And I showed you a picture of that. And in, and in some of those pictures, it shows these gods being brought clothing or cloth to make their clothing. One of them is being brought a, a cushion to sit on. Other, others of them are being brought food to eat. So what does that tell? What does that tell us about? What does that tell us about the Greek gods? Yeah, they they depended on man. They depended on man, and they were the the the, the pursuit of pleasure was their end goal. And so, what did Paul say? By the way, Paul was at Mars Hill where the freeze was in Acts seventeen. He was standing right there. I mean, he saw exactly what I took a picture of. I think that's incredible. That just thrills me to think about that. You know, I was standing and looking at the exact same thing Paul laid his eyes on. And he said, the God of heaven is not made with men's hands, neither is he served with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life, breath, and all things. In other words, all the things your gods need, my God gives. Drawing a contrast between the God of heaven and, and the gods of the Greeks. But when you, when, you see, when you see just the idolatry, the sexual immorality, <clears throat> uh, lack of self-restraint at all levels. I mean, the gods were all, you know, I was just reading this morning about, uh, about Atlas and Hercules. You know, Atlas, uh, you know, Atlas was holding, they say the world, actually was holding up the sky. But, you know, they're talking about the weight of the world. All right, so Atlas is holding up the weight of the world, and he's got to go do something. And, uh, and Hercules, uh, Hercules takes over for him. And then, uh, so then Atlas is not too keen on going back to holding up the sky. And so then Hercules tricks him into taking it back. Well, those, you know, those are the titans. Those are their gods. You know, does our god work like that? You know, our, our God is not a God of deception. You know, think about the revenge and, the, uh, uh, the, and the, the, uh, the way that the gods dealt with one another and the way they dealt with men. Our, our God, the God of heaven, doesn't work like that. And so they could never rise above their view of their gods. So that's why they were so grossly immoral. And that's why the true people of God need to be people of absolute, utter holiness or the pursuit of of holiness, because that's who our God is. You know, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy in all manner of your conduct. First Peter one and verse fifteen. For it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Verse sixteen. So we want to hold God in the absolute highest regard for our own benefit, so that we can so that we can strive to attain 
a, a, a greater and higher level of, of holiness. Um, down at the bottom of page two, some quotes here from, from uh, A.W. Uh, Tozier and uh, a book on the knowledge of the holy. It says, the gravest, in other words, the most important question before the church is always God himself. The most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. Last line, our real idea of God may lie buried under the rubbish of conventional religious notions. In other words, we can allow ourselves to be influenced and have our minds cluttered about who God really is by the things that we see that other people uh, use and portray with regard uh, to God. I love the line at the top of page 3. It's just a great line. The man who comes to a right relief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. For he sees at once that these have to do with the matters which at the most cannot concern him very long. In other words, when I have the proper view of God, the right belief about God, all of this foolishness that, that, that I struggle with in the world, uh, as Brother Guy Wood used to say, uh, disappears like dew before the morning sun. It's temporary. You know, it's here for a little while, and then you realize what's really important, about it and and then it's gone. You know, think about you know how much time you know how much time do we spend worrying, you know, about politics or sports or our country or all those things. Now, I'm not saying that those are not. Th I'm not saying those are things that that are wrong in and of themselves. But you know. If my mind is consumed, if my mind is consumed with those things rather than being consumed with being more like God, then I've got the wrong idea about God. You know, look, if, if the Lord delays His coming, the United States of America will find its place in the scrap heap of history just like every other kingdom that's ever lived, that's ever been. And, you know, but what continues on? The church. The church continues on. And so, you know, so if, if that is indeed the case, and the most important, if the most important thing is, am I ready to meet the God of heaven when he sends Jesus back? You know, if that's my most important thing, then the rest of this just becomes noise. You know, it's static. But it's not, it's not going to dominate. It's not going to dominate my thinking. It's not going to dominate because it's not that important. You know, ultimately, it's not that, it's not that, Important, and then uh, on the top, uh, uh, underneath that, at number three, turn in your Bibles to Psalm fifty. There's a little more here than than uh, than is in the book. I'm not criticizing the book. I'm just saying there, there's more here that I want us to, to think about. We got a bell ringer this morning. Been over a year. Yeah, we got one. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. All right, look at Psalm 50. Look at Psalm 50. Look at verse 16. We're going to read verses 16 and 17 and skip down to 21. Listen to what it says. But to the wicked God says, what right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? I find that interesting. You know, there are so many people who take it on themselves to speak for God when in fact they're not willing to accept what God himself has said. Does that make sense? That's what God said. What right do you have to talk about me or my covenant when you won't even listen to what I'm trying to tell you. Now look at verse 21 through 23. These things you have done and I kept silent. Listen to this. You thought that I was altogether like you. That's what God says. You thought I was like you. But I will rebuke you and set in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God. 
lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. You thought I was like you. So what have we been talking about? What do people do? What do people do with God? They try to make God like themselves. They try to make God like themselves. And God said, I'm not like you. And then invariably, how, you, know, what does, you know, what does man do with God? He, he fashions God in his own image. God said, that's not me at all. He said, and, and on top of that, he says, I'll tear you into pieces and there'll be nobody to deliver you. In other words, the, the, the God that you're worshiping won't help you. All right, um, the last uh, three lines under there, under number three. Under number three, I'll make a note here. And then we'll, we'll... It says, the essence of idolatry. Remember, covetousness is idolatry. Anything that comes between me and God is idolatry. The essence of idolatry is the entertaining of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. It begins in the mind... The idolater simply imagines things about God and acts as if they were true. Imagines things about God and then acts as though they were true. Do we see that today? That people think things about God. You know, God just accept our service as long as, long as it makes me happy, as long as, I, as long as I do it and I have a good heart, God, God will take it. So what is that? That's making God in my image and then acting as if what I think about God is true. Which is why David said, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins that I might not sin against thee. Alright, so we'll stop right there. We'll pick up in, uh, on number four, uh, Lord willing, next, next Sunday morning.